Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. I think we're on. This is terrific. Thank you all for joining us. I really want to thank Dean Rouse and President Tillman for hosting this wonderful event. And it's great to see the commitment from as, uh, as wonderful a university as Princeton to such an important debate. So thank you for hosting us. And want to thank our partners at the New Jersey Healthcare Quality Institute and CHOP for helping us bring such intellectual health, health heft to this debate. And I should also mention the Center for Health and Wellbeing where I sit at Princeton and the Woodrow Wilson School is also co-sponsoring. So to our friends at the Center for Health and Wellbeing, thank you also. So as, as we heard from um, the opening speakers, this issue is broader than just the unfortunate tragedies that make the news all the time. So what we're going to be able to do today is delve in with these experts into the what is gun violence and why is it a public health issue. We've got two terrific panels. This first panel is going to look at how public health can inf research can inform uh, our, our debates about gun violence. What can we learn from public health? And we've got amazing researchers here that we're going to talk about it. I'm going to facilitate some discussion, and then we'll open it up to public questions. So if you've got questions, jot them down, and there will be a point towards the end of the discussion where we'll, we'll turn the mics over to you all. So do, keep, do, do think of questions as we go through this, this discussion, and do feel free to, to, stand, to stand up when we do open it up. Um, we, you have their bios, so I didn't want to read them because they are, um, they are all that and more. And instead, I thought I would ask them first just to open up and give us a couple minutes about what they do. So not their bio and not, the, not the, where they went to school, but really what they're doing now, which will set the table for the discussion. So I'm going to start with Bill to my left. Thanks, everybody. I'm Bill Schwab. And just to tell you what I do is I'm going to go ahead and take you back to a, a great and a, actually a humorous memory. And that's the movie and the television show MASH. I run basically a military anti-shock trauma unit. I've done that for 25 years at the University of Pennsylvania. And one of the sponsors is the Children's Hospital, which is 50 miles or 50 feet to the south of the hospital the University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> What's interesting about that unit, and uh, Governor Florio mentioned uh, a couple aspects of that, is I was trained actually as a military surgeon during Vietnam. And so I was very familiar, actually, with wounding. And when I came to the hospital at the University of Pennsylvania in 1987, about two years later, the first epidemic of urban firearm injury started. From 1990 until the present time, we operate on one gunshot wound a day, every day, every year. And for that reason, we are a major training center, not only of our own trainees in surgery, but trainees that are sent from militaries now, not just in the United States, but around the world. In fact, the surgical techniques that we've worked on in the 90s to try and save lives of these young people, these young adults, these adolescents, and these children that are wounded in American cities actually prepared the United States and allied military medical corps to go to the armed conflict in Iraq and Afghanistan. My research has largely been in the surgical techniques and the techniques of resuscitation to try to make the survival of these wounds largely because of multiple shots, multiple bullets going into bodies, which is quite different than anything that's ever been seen on a battlefield, but to try to reverse that and to try to save their lives. Hi, welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Jan Vernick, and I'm the co-director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Gun Policy and Research, which is at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And I got my start in public health research and policy more than uh, 20, almost 25 years ago now um, in motor vehicle crash injury prevention, another consumer product that's associated today with around 30,000, a little bit more, 35,000 or so uh, deaths in the United States every year. But unlike gun violence prevention, we've actually seen enormous progress in motor vehicle crash injury prevention. If you look at the, the rate per mile traveled of motor vehicle crash deaths since the early 1960s, that rate has declined by more than 75%. It's an enormous, an enormous public health success story. And, and how, did we, how did we accomplish that? 
Well, maybe it's easier to say how we didn't accomplish that. What, what, we, what we didn't do was focus exclusively on um, what used to be called the nut behind the wheel, that is, the dangerous driver. Instead, we focused on, yes, trying to make drivers safer to reduce their consumption of alcohol, but also to make the car safer and to make the roadway safer. So after doing that work for some time, and I still do some motor vehicle crash injury prevention, I came to, to Johns Hopkins and with a group of other folks there at Hopkins have been trying to apply some of the same techniques that we apply to other public health measures to gun violence prevention. And so that means, at my center in particular, that means not just understanding the risk factors uh, and the causes for gun violence, but trying to use research to evaluate what works and what doesn't work to reduce gun violence, and then to try to put that information into the hands of policymakers and advocates who can use it to make a difference. So that's why I'm especially glad to be here today. So thank you. Hi, I'm Charlie Brannis. Um, also very glad to be here and pleasure to be following the president of Princeton University and the governor. It's, it's quite impressive for, for me. Um, so my background uh, in this began, I was in EMS in uh, the city of Philadelphia as well as in the city of Baltimore. And um, while working in EMS, I had a great opportunity to uh, work in the Philadelphia morgue um, and to see uh, what was there and the, the tragedies that befell the morgue. But more importantly, I had an opportunity to take all the death certificates in the Philadelphia morgue and put them into the first database that they were using. Uh, and it was quite an experience for me to see, not just to see these events happen one by one, but to see them cumulatively over the course of years. Uh, and that led me to a career in epidemiology, training in the School of Public Health, led me to do um, studies of death and violent death, and particularly gun death for the entire United States. We had looked at uh, a half million um, uh, of these sorts of gun deaths for a decade period in the United States. And it really struck me, the numbers are staggering, and perhaps some of you don't know the numbers, but um, you know, we have about 100,000 shootings every year in the United States. Um, the city of Philadelphia experiences about five shootings a day. This is a mass tragedy every week uh, uh, here. And many of these are not spoken about. The war in West Philadelphia and the war in North Philadelphia are not uh, discussed. Um, I went on the train in public health under some esteemed faculty at Johns Hopkins, um, as well as to learn from some of our senior faculty at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, but I not only trained in public health, I also co-trained in the School of Engineering at Johns Hopkins and learned more about uh, geography. And so right now, I, uh, not only am I in the Department of Epidemiology at the University of Pennsylvania, but I also direct our university's uh, cartographic modeling laboratory. So I think a lot about the environment and how spaces affect people's health, in particular how spaces and changes to spaces and environments uh, might be used uh, to improve people's health and reduce things like gun violence, which we consider a major public health issue. So you see what a great panel this is already. You've touched on a bunch of things. I know we want to go deeper on the built environment. I know we want to talk about what we learned from car, from our reduction in automobile um, fatalities. So, so we're going to get there, but I want to start with Bill, you're on the front lines as you, literally the front lines as you talked about, and you picked up on the great theme that Governor Florio had developed. How do you see gun violence affecting our healthcare system? Can you talk about that? Well, uh, first and foremost, uh, let me just say that, that what you know is the numbers. It's very difficult. You've, you've heard a couple numbers already today uh, from the president of the university, and you've heard Charlie just say 100,000 shootings. The difficulty here is, is that nobody really knows exactly. As a matter of fact, the accurate data that we have is probably two years old at best, and John can certainly uh, correct me on that. But nobody really knows the number of shootings. We know approximately the number of people that are wounded, both fatally and non-fatally. And I have to tell you that that is a major, major problem and a major, major responsibility of not just public health, but of health care and medicine. And there are forms in which 
this debate starts and all of a sudden it's a law enforcement problem. This is not just a law enforcement problem. This is a health care and medicine problem. Any disease, if it was an infectious disease and acquired any disease that would affect 100,000 people every year in this country, 30 some odd thousand of those being fatalities, we would have the most mobilized health care system to address with our public health partners about how to low lower that toll. Why is Governor Florio so meaningful to me? Governor Florio is so meaningful to me because he took a stand in 1991. Our paper came out in 1993 looking at the effect of wounding. And I want to tell you that had it not been for trauma centers, trauma systems, and the type of physicians, surgeons, and nurses, et cetera, that we've mentioned to you, I think the numbers would be much higher today than they are. In fact, those systems go to work every minute of every day and save people that 20 years ago would have died. Why? Because the weapons have changed. I'm a military surgeon by training. Part of my orientation from medical school and my surgical training to prepare to take care of those that were wounded in Vietnam was to learn about the weapons. The semi-automatic pistol changed it all. Between 1985, when they were made commercially available in the United States, to 1989, when we started to see the wounds in droves, the wounding pattern and the death patterns changed. It's a huge toll, and it's part of the problem that we have to face. And what I would love to see is that health care is emancipated and feels emancipated to join in this debate. So you, you, it was great. You, you've gotten us into the numbers. Jan and Charlie, is he, is he right? Is it, an, is it an epidemic? And is that, you know, for, from a public health perspective, is that the right way to be talking about it? I think there's, there's no doubt. So, so we've already mentioned several times now 30,000 deaths in the United States every year uh, due to gunfire. That includes homicides, suicides, and accidental gun deaths. We estimate another 70,000 or so non-fatal shootings serious enough to require a trip to an emergency department. That, that's a real estimate. We, we, don't, we do a relatively good job of counting bodies, but we don't do an especially good job of counting injuries. We haven't yet mentioned the more than 300,000 or so violent crimes committed with a firearm every year, violent crimes that no, don't necessarily result in, in an injury. It's, it's an epidemic that affects our healthcare delivery system, but, but it affects us in ways that we probably don't even think about. It affects our willingness to, to walk at night, or to send our kids to, to play by themselves in a, in a park somewhere. It affects the value of our homes if a, if a neighborhood starts to become violent. It, it affects, affects so many different aspects of, of our lives. The, the best and most recent estimate for the total societal cost of gun violence in any given year comes from economists Phil Cook and Jens Ludwig at $100 billion per, per year. I mean, enormous social cost, including medical, but other costs as well. So I think something that's interesting in the study we did, uh, now it's coming on a decade, um, of gun deaths in the US. And what most people don't understand is that, first off, there are more gun suicides in the US than gun homicides every year. And the risk of gun death is fairly flat going across rural, suburban, and urban areas. The difference is in the, our most rural parts of the US, it's who does the shooting. It's a gun suicide problem, whereas it's about the equivalent risk per citizen in our major cities. So the ubiquitous nature of it is, is there, and we've raised that in the past. So I want to pivot off what Jan said, but also what Bill said, I think it's worthwhile. I, so I talk to a lot of different people on this issue. Um, and there's a non-trivial group of Americans who don't think this ha that public health has no place here. Um, and I, I, I want to just restate, okay, that the medical system is part and parcel with the public health system. 
and that medical resources are used here each time a shooting happens. There isn't, there isn't some sort of Sopranos thing going on here where a significant number of these uh, shootings and gun deaths get carted off and never touch the medical system. Almost every single one of them touches the medical system in some way. The morgue system is part of the medical system and the public health system and the hospitals and the clinics in this country are as well. So to argue that this is not a public health issue is a really false argument. Okay, that this is simply a law enforcement issue. That's not true. Law enforcement and public health have to work together. And while that may seem obvious to some of you, I want you to really consume that and be ready to, to make that argument at some point in the future. So when we think public health, we think surveillance, we think evidence-based interventions. Are, are, are we doing enough of them? You all are on the front lines of, of the research, but are we doing enough of it, enough of that? And what are the challenges on that research front? Well, if you're talking about the, the challenges to actually conducting mm. the, the research, you know, it's, it's like the old, uh, the old saw about, about the, the West that water runs uphill to money. Well, research um, <laughs> runs uphill or water from money runs uphill to something like that. Uh, and, and unfortunately, funding for gun violence prevention research has been um, very difficult to obtain for the last 15 or, or 20 years. Some of you may know the story that in the middle 1990s, the National Rifle Association became upset with the research that was being funded by and sometimes conducted by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC. They're the, they're the primary public health federal agency that, that does research into a whole host of, of health problems, including injuries and gun and gun related injuries as well. The NRA became upset with that and they succeeded in adding some language to the NRA's, sorry, to the CDC's annual appropriations um, bill that said that CDC was not permitted to advocate for gun control. And of course, they weren't advocating for gun control even, even before, but the, the effect of that language was to, to chill research uh, and the funding of research by, by CDC. And as a result, um, it's been very difficult to persuade young researchers to go into the, to not, no offense, Charlie, that you and I aren't young anymore. And, and, <laughs> it's very uh, true. Um, so who is Bill, funny? Bill is it's young. It's true so, <laughs> that it's difficult to persuade young yes. researchers. Dig <laughs> so yourself out of that hole. Thank okay. you, I'll do my, Wait, I'll so do my best. It? So there are a handful of private foundations that, that fund gun violence prevention, probably the most prominent of which is the Joyce Foundation that's located in Chicago. There is some, um, some other smaller foundations. There are gifts that are provided by private um, philanthropies. There is still some funding from the, from the government, from uh, the Department of Justice, from NIH. I think Charlie's been funded from the National Institutes of, of Health. But nothing, nothing like the, um, the kind of funding that would be warranted given the scope of the problem. As, as Bill was saying, if this were any other kind of public health problem, we would be devoting resources for research and many other things much, much greater than we are today. So, so from the NIH side, and so uh, in addition to what Jan was saying, the NIH is a much larger, it's about five to seven times larger than the Centers for Disease Control. It is the nation's leading scientific health agency, okay? It's a behemoth. In the past 30 years, we had done some audits of this. Uh, if you think 30 years, I told you about 100,000 events a year, 100,000 cases of illness here in gun violence a year. Um, that's about three million, okay, over 30 years. Cases of illness, there have been three uh, major awards, major scientific awards. Now you compare that to something like uh, rabies, okay, where there have been hundreds of awards for hundreds of cases um, and other things along those lines. Um, not to say that that's not important, but the disproportionate nature of the funding is stark. It's very, very stark. Pardon me for interrupting. The, no. the, the good news is that following the Newtown shooting, President Obama instructed the CDC to, to reconsider 
its funding agenda for gun violence prevention. I don't think any new money was actually appropriated, and CDC doesn't have very much money for, for almost anything, frankly. But at least he's encouraging CDC to, to think about re-energizing its um, gun violence prevention research agenda. And so CDC asked the National Academies of Science, um, in particular the Institute of Medicine, which is part of the National Academies, to give CDC advice about, well, what, what should we be funding? Uh, and Charlie and I had the, the good fortune of being able to give that committee some advice, and we'll be seeing its, uh, its report very soon that makes recommendations to CDC about just what kinds of research it should be funding. So, so Bill, you, you talked about seeing this not as a law enforcement issue, and it, do you See, do you find that research can change that conversation? Do you find that your research helps you do that? Are you getting traction? Well, uh, <laughs> the broader question, has research actually solved questions in the past? It's, a, it's kind of a question that doesn't need to be asked. Let me just say from, the, from being a clinical surgeon that's been interested in this and, and looking for answers, I think the only hope here is research. I have to tell you that I really get angry, and I get angry at 3 o'clock in the morning in the operating room when we're patching up yet another young man. Uh, and to, to think that I live in this country and essentially our scientists are gagged and our scientists can't get money, I, I just can't imagine that this is happening in the United States. When we're losing this number of people a year and our scientists are gagged and can't receive money to try in an objective way to find out how to lower the toll of firearm violence. I also think it's absolutely ridiculous, and the governor mentioned some of this, that we can't even begin to dialogue. And I want to say that we began to dialogue in the 1990s, and it all went away. It all went away. This dialogue occurred and was going on in the 1990s. It's been muted. It's not only been muted, but I think it's taken a step backwards. And what I think's happened is people are actually afraid to discuss this. And that, to me, is, is absolutely the biggest worry that I have. In order to change public opinion, in order to be able to begin a dialogue, we have to prevent, present the American public with, with the data. We have to present them with how big of an issue this is. And I think that's the biggest scourge that's going on in America. Heather, can I pivot yeah, off your please. comment that, that you said that I don't think any one of us want to go on record as saying this isn't a law enforcement issue. Okay. Isn't just a law enforcement Yeah, exactly. And so this is a law enforcement issue. It's also a health issue very clearly. Um, we work with police departments and police agencies around the country. Uh, I'll also say we work with uh, housing agencies around the country and other um, players here. Um, so this is a multifaceted issue where public health potentially plays a major role in convening these different individuals around the intent of improving health via reducing gun violence. Well, so are there, as, as frustrated as you are, are there some good stories? Jan, can you, aren't, aren't, aren't there good statistics, for example, out of New York City? Are there some places where there are rays of hope? Yes, so, so there are places where, um, where gun violence has declined very substantially. So New York City is, is one of the premier examples. Uh, there was a time not long ago, within the last couple of decades, when there were more than 2,000 homicides per year in, in New York City, most of which were committed with firearms. Uh, we've seen that number, I haven't seen the most recent figure, maybe one of you has seen it, but that number today is, is closer to 500. I mean, an enormous decline. Um, unfortunately, we don't really know why that's happened. And one of the reasons is precisely because we haven't been able to fund the kind of research that we need. We suspect, we strongly suspect that it's a combination of um, among the best laws in the country designed to keep guns out of the hands of high-risk people, innovative policing practices, innovative community programs that provide alternatives for young people, a whole host of, of things. And maybe that'll be one of the messages from this panel today, which is that there's no, just as there's so many different kinds of 
of gun violence, homicide, suicide, accident. Within homicides, you have um, homicides among domestic partners. You have homicides on the street over drugs. You have, you have um, spur of the moment homicides over, over other kinds of disputes. Just as there's many, many different kinds of, um, of gun-related violence, we need a comprehensive approach to the problem. There's no single solution. And it appears that New York has done a good job at, um, at uh, coming up with that kind of comprehensive approach. But we need more uh, research to understand just how they've been so effective. Well, I mean, and speaking of comprehensive approaches, you started, um, Jan, by talking about the great public health success in reducing motor vehicle fatalities. I think if you go back and you talk, I'd like to hear from each of you, because you each see it in different ways. Wasn't that the result of a comprehensive approach based on a lot of the public health uh, learnings? It, it most definitely was. So, so the approach there was to make the car safer, for example, to add airbags and good seat belts and gas tanks that didn't explode when your Ford Pinto got hit from behind. Um, but it also included legislative approaches, seat, seat belt laws that required you to, to wear your belt, changes to the design of the roadway. It also included changes to drunk driving laws that mandated much lower levels of alcohol um, content in one's blood before one uh, counted as drunk, changes to social norms about whether it was appropriate to, to drink or not. And then maybe enormously importantly, on top of all these interventions that were tried, there was a firm research base. We, we funded enormous amounts of research to figure out which of those interventions were working. We replicated those, which, ones, which ones weren't working, and we dismissed those. If, if I could comment. Um, just to, to make some type of a connection for you, in the last six months, Time Magazine carried uh, two bold covers and stories. One bold cover was, if you remember, the gunslingers, and that was the three people in America that are taking on the gun lobby. This appeared shortly after the disaster in Connecticut. If you read that article, it had data in it, it had description, but it didn't have a plan. It didn't have a plan. And then a few months later, if you recall, uh, the, the bold story was actually about essentially where we are on the war on cancer. The war on cancer, if you try to look at that phrase and where it came from, it came from the 1930s. It was a pre-World War II um, phrase that people came up with and said, we're going to combat cancer. If one uses cancer just as a, as a type and says, how should we approach this, picking up on what Jan said? We need a comprehensive approach to death or wounding by firearm. What you'll hear from Joel Fine in a few minutes about the child in the home finding the gun, the teenager in a bad place at a bad time with a drive-by shooting, or the young adult who might be carrying a gun because they fear for their lives in a hot neighborhood where every other young man is carrying a gun. Those are three different types of gun death and wounding. And we haven't even scratched the surface about the difficulty that we have with gun suicide. Again, one can look at that over the spectrum of life, and one has to say that when one goes if you would, the qualitative research and looks at those autopsies psychologically and physically, one finds out that what goes on in, in our elders in rural America is quite different than what goes on actually in suburban America among the young. But I think those two articles left me with, again, the frustration that why can't we declare a war on firearm violence and begin a comprehensive dialogue and then let our scientists actually guide that, just as they've guided us actually with the cure for many of the cancers. We almost need to pause and reflect on that. That's a great point. Do you want, do you want to jump in? So I would add, just to say that the, the reduction in motor vehicle crash deaths over the past half of the last century is what the CDC has called one of the 10 greatest public health achievements of the last century, right? So, and it's so precipitous, in fact, that um, soon, maybe in the next year or two, um, 
the rate um, of gun death is going to eclipse the rate of motor vehicle death. Um, and so I think that's an important point yeah, to, but to, your to point, drink but in. But yet it still doesn't seem to galvanize. Yeah, and so, so the inquirer, we had given the inquirer this information that, that um, years ago, that there are about five shootings a day in the city of Philadelphia. And the lead story on the front page of the inquirer was, uh, you know, violence ravages Philadelphia neighborhoods, five shootings a day on average, uh, but knowing that isn't helping to change anything. Okay, so it's useful information, but I think it's interesting for us to move to what is the action that we can begin to think about here, similar to as Jan was pointing out and Bill were pointing out, what was the action to reduce motor vehicle crash deaths? How did that great achievement happen? Well, again, as he was saying, that things were changed about the automobile, things were changed about drivers, perhaps, perhaps driver education had a place here. Um, but one of the things we've been working very heavily on is the roadway. Yeah, what's the equivalent of the roadway in our in our major cities? Okay, uh, we think that it is blighted and abandoned spaces, blighted and abandoned housing. Okay, the places where violence um, festers, particularly where gun violence festers, and we've been looking a lot under funding from the National Institutes of Health at a lot of different health outcomes, not just gun violence, mind you, but looking at a lot, what happens when you change these spaces? What happens when you clean these spaces, when you green these spaces? And our initial findings are that changing that built environment gets people much more invested in their neighborhoods and their communities, okay, and reduces gun violence in that way. Informal policing of the community goes up dramatically people are much more willing to protect that space and call the police if, if even the tiniest uh, incident is going on. It's also changing the physical space itself, not permitting in particular, so the tangible aspect of this is it's very difficult for criminals, okay, who can't, who are in a business by the way. So criminals who are moving illegal drugs are in a business. They have disputes like other businesses, like legal businesses, but it's not possible for them to call the police, to call 911 to resolve their disputes, so they have to be armed. But they can't carry the guns with them all the time because if they get caught with them, their, their price of being caught is much higher, so they put them in these abandoned spaces. So when you clean these spaces, clear them of the opportunity for these uh, storage, what the, the Philadelphia police call storage lockers, illegal gun storage lockers in the city of Philadelphia, um, gun crime goes down in and around those spaces precipitously, okay, and by a significant amount. So we're really thinking about the roadway here. If you want that analogy is, another, is a good analogy. Malaria is another good analogy. You know, this is not allowing the mosquitoes to fester in the swamp to begin with, okay? Um, so these are all useful. And this is partly where public health comes in here in thinking about um, preventing Public health also thinks about reacting in the form of medicine, and that's very successful, but we also think about preventing these things before they ever happen, and treating the environment uh, is an important component of that. Well, I'm, rem I'm reminded, and I should have showed this earlier, that Jan has co-authored a terrific book, um, and so I'm gonna turn on you now, Jan, that, and say, reducing gun violence in America is, is, the, is the headline, and it's it, it recently published, right? Yes, uh, in late January. So, so Charlie's given some examples. We talked earlier about those of us who are New Jerseyans know the, um, the jug handles, apparently, were based on a lot of a significant research that the state did about traffic safety and jug handles have reduced. Yes, correct. Have Even reduced. if you don't like them, they actually enhance safety. Maybe because you don't like them. <laughs> That's right. So, I, I, you know, you've talked about some of the jug handles of, of, of the built environment and and ways we can make the community safer to prevent violence. Are there others that you can point to? Other yeah, so, so Charlie's done a wonderful job of talking about the, the environment, the, uh, the environmental factors. My, my center has recently been focusing very heavily on the, the individual um, factors, and in particular on what we can do to do a better job of keeping guns out of the hands of dangerous, high-risk people while imposing the, the least restrictions on law-abiding gun owners. And most gun owners are very law-abiding. Most gun owners um, will never misuse their, their gun. 
But from a public health perspective, when we're thinking about the safety of the community, we have to think about ways to keep guns out of the hands of these high-risk people in the first place. And probably the, the, the most reasonable kind of approach, which Governor Florio uh, alluded to, is in, in the United States, if I go and knock on the, the door of my, my local gun dealer and I want to buy uh, a firearm, a background check has to be conducted to make sure that I am uh, not a person who's prohibited from owning a gun, that is, not a convicted felon or have a serious uh, history of very serious mental illness or a handful of other criteria which prohibit me from, from owning a gun. If instead of knocking on the door of my local gun dealer, I, lock, I knock on my neighbor's door over the back fence and I say, hey, you know, I, I know that you, you're a gun owner, collector, maybe you have an extra gun you'd like to sell me. In, in most U.S. states, and I'm happy to report that New Jersey is an important exception, but in most U.S. states, that sale can take place perfectly lawfully with no background check conducted. And again, as Governor Florio alluded to, our best estimate is that about 40% of all firearm, firearms change hands every year in that very, very unregulated private market. So that's the bill that the, that the Senate ultimately chose not to, uh, not to pass, came six votes uh, short uh, in the Senate, um, that would have required a universal background check. That's the sort of backbone law that we need to keep guns out of the hands of high-risk people. We also need to make sure that if we do have a universal background check system, that the data being accessed are as good as they can be, that we have complete information about whether, for example, you have a, a history of very serious mental illness that's required that you be uh, involuntarily committed or adjudicated incompetent. And I know that there are, there's legislation in New Jersey that would improve the system for, for reporting those kinds, of, um, those kinds of mental health histories. And there are people... Brian Miller here in the audience uh, who, um, who works for what I think is one of the most effective gun violence prevention organizations in the country who've been working on that issue and, and many others to try to take New Jersey's um, very, um, very impressive laws to begin with and, and make them better. But of course, national laws are more effective than state laws because guns travel across state lines so easily. The majority of the guns used in crime in New Jersey are coming from other states. That's not true elsewhere. Where gun laws are weaker, of course criminals will prefer to purchase the guns locally. It's easier. But where gun laws are, are more effective at keeping guns out of the hands of high-risk people, they, they go across state lines. So New Jersey has laws like a licensing law, a basic law that says before you go to the gun dealer at all, you have to obtain a license from law enforcement. Um, there's only uh, 15 or so states that have any kind of licensing provision in the United States. So there's a long way we can go to make it harder, not impossible, but harder for the most dangerous people to gain access to guns. Can we also... Can we make the product safer? I mean, that's one thing from a public health perspective we think about. We made cars safer. Um, can we make guns safer? Can I, can I broaden yes, that a little yes. bit? What about making the people safer? Please. I, I think one of the things, and, and Charlie can give you the numbers, but I think Charlie made a statement that uh, I'm sure you were shocked that the number of deaths by firearms in several years is going to exceed that related to motor vehicle. It's wonderful because we're driving safer cars, etc. But the number of firearms in America now is approaching 300 million. There's no, ways, no way that our society won't be a society with guns. So then you have to ask yourself the question, if we've chosen to live in a society with guns, how can we make all of us safer? What about informing people even before we start talking about technologically modifying the gun to make it safer, but informing people. Why is it that we know that in many households, a spouse doesn't even know there's being a gun in the house, much less how it's stored? And why is it that consumer products is actually banned from at least having some kind of information about owning a gun in the home? Um, I think actually it's all about creating a dialogue of safety 
and demanding once, and this will take a lot of public information, but demanding that in fact Americans know the true, the true problem here. The problem is we are living with a sea of guns. Thank heavens most of those, and, and I would say, we, we, I, I will just tell you, we rarely, rarely see, this is now homicide and assault, we rarely see a wounding or a fatality by a, a military weapon or by a shotgun. You see those sometimes in rural America. Many of those are accidental. But this is largely about a handgun, the type of, weapon, the type of wounding that we're talking about. That's, Bill, that's hap let me oh, just, just very quickly. Uh, although handguns, our best estimate is, are about 40% of the civilian stock of guns in the United States, when you look at gun-related homicides, handguns are close to 90% of all of the gun-related homicides. So, and, and then we'll go to you, Charlie, on the product safety, but Bill, in terms of the, the doctor-patient relationship, it got a lot of attention when Florida tried to ban a physicians asking about guns in the home, right? I mean, are you familiar with yeah. that? And, and can you talk about, the, so, uh, how, how would you approach that issue? It should, be, it should be the kind of thing a physician should be talking to a patient about safety in the home, and this should be one of the things that should be discussed? Or Well, currently, so that you can now take a big breath, you realize that that was a Florida uh, <laughs> law. It was uh, actually going to be uh, debated, and, and currently my information, at least unless it's changed within the last couple of weeks, is that it's tabled, and at least uh, it's tabled because of a, of a federal judge saying that it, we needed some more time for that. There were First Amendment issues, of course. Well, right? there's yeah. just, there's all kind of issues. It's really fascinating that we can talk about uh, through the, through the physician-patient relationship, we can talk about anything about health and we can do health screening. And it, it's, it, it, is, it is part and parcel, I think, of, of education that occurs. It's interesting, you know, if you think about it, uh, especially being a surgeon, I'm in the repair business. <laughs> I'm not in the health business. But yet, when I see people, and I am actually now I get a three-sheet summary that the patient or the patient's family fills out that's their health screening. And isn't it fascinating that one of the questions that we used to ask at the University of Pennsylvania is, do you own a gun? Mm -hmm. And the reason is, is because of the follow-up of that is, is it stored safely? If you have children in the house, are you aware that it needs to be stored in the following way? And there is information that we can give you to show you how to do that. That's generally been removed, actually, from our practices, not by an edict or fear that this would happen in Pennsylvania, I hope, but in all honesty, just because it's such a politically hot issue right now that I don't believe the health system wanted to get into that. The, the Florida law was, was struck down by a federal judge as vi a violation of the First Amendment rights of the doctor to speak, but Bill is quite right. It's, uh, it, they're considering ch either changes to the law or appealing the judge's ruling. But Charlie, can we make the product safer? Is that can, I, can I just, I want to come back to the, so this is the science panel, the research panel. So I want to say that there is a real role for science here um, to begin to think about what are the risks of gun ownership, but also what are the benefits of gun ownership. And we have at this point a veritable handful of good studies that begin to unpackage that and are only scratching the surface. So we don't have good answers to these risks and benefits, okay? And we need to invest more. And both sides politically have a vested interest in this, and the science could help adjudicate this, this issue, okay? To inform individuals about what, uh, what their personal choices might be and what's best for them. Now, in terms of the firearms themselves, so Jan can speak more about smart gun technology, but I, I will say that I, I think that scientifically, we haven't had enough actual laboratory study of different types of firearms. So the, the, the corollary here, the, I'm sorry, the analogy here in the motor vehicle side of things is that the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has this facility called the National uh, uh, Drive, Automated Driving Simulator okay, at the University of Iowa. It's a massive, multi, multi-million dollar endeavor. It's basically this a uh, simulator in a multiple gymnasium sized room at the University of Iowa paid by the federal government where they run constant studies, have been doing it for a decade now, 
where they will put people under different conditions in different types of cars, uh, many, many other things. For instance, they, they did the original work that determined or informed the policy for the .08 driving law. So when we found out that we had some inkling that it, you couldn't drink and drive, policymakers didn't say we were going to ban drinking and driving by the way, you have to think about that. They said, we want to find the point where maybe you can have a drink and still drive. What is that point for people that is the legal limit? And, and we should pause because it's gotten news recently that there, there's recent recommendations about lowering that rate, correct? Perhaps. Based right. on and continued so, revisiting exactly. of the facts, you have the evidence. And yeah. based on those, that, those hundreds of millions of dollars that are going into, this, into that driving simulator and others now that the federal government is investing in, we have no such thing for firearms. And I'll tell you, we ran, you know, they've run tens of thousands of, of people through these things as, as, uh, as study participants. We did one on, with a gun simulator, a shooting simulator, by the way, which the military use all the time. We have these, they exist. Uh, many police agencies train and qualify their officers on these simulators, okay? But we and Washington State University, the only universities that have done any work on it, we've only managed to find the funding to run 13 people through uh, our study. Um, but it was a fascinating little bit of work to try to figure out. We did we had nothing conclusive, just a pilot study, but it was fascinating to try to figure out whether we could do it, but also what, at what level should you be permitted to, to drink and still possess your firearm? And we did it. We pursued this because there are so few laws around the country that mo most states don't have a law on the books about drinking and possessing a firearm, okay? So there's nothing, in fact, many states are relaxing that law to permit you to take your weapon into bars and so forth. Um, so this sort of scientific research directed at the product itself and thinking about not, and again, it's not to ban the product, it's to figure out what are the reasonable conditions upon which you can safely use that product for its intent. The intent may be hunting, the intent may be personal safety. Okay, but all these are really important to, to let the user and the owner of the product gain the full benefit of that consumer product. So, so I agree with Charlie, and I, I, I will mention that there, there are ways that we can make the gun itself safer. You don't, you don't think about the gun as a consumer product that can be made safer in the way we make other consumer products safe. Guns are designed to expel a projectile, right? Um, but, um, but we can make them safer. I'll mention two two kinds of um, approaches. One is to, ma to make the gun, some people say personalized, some people say s a smart gun, some people say a child-proof gun. It's a gun that can't be operated except by its authorized user. A gun that uses some kind of technology like maybe the, some of you may have a laptop that will read your fingerprint uh, before it opens up or, or lower tech kinds of solutions that, that tells that it's in the hands of of an authorized user. Um, and this is technology that, frankly, is off the shelf and just has to be integrated into firearms and is being integrated into firearms as, as we speak by a number of, um, of entrepreneurial companies. And New Jersey actually has a really interesting, unique law, uh, the law that um, was enacted in New Jersey, again, with the help of, of advocacy organizations in the state, uh, says that as soon as the first personalized gun is widely available for sale in the state, certified as available for sale, then the clock starts ticking and within three years all new handguns sold in the state will have to be personalized. So the idea is to try to drive the, the market for the technology. An another kind of very simple way to make certain kinds of handguns safer is something called a, a loaded chamber indicator. The, the idea is something that just tells you is the gun loaded or not. I mean, how simple is, is that? Your camera tells you if it's loaded with film, if, if you're old enough to remember cameras that have film in them. Um, and and it's, it's, not, it's not rocket science. California has enacted a law that requires new handgun models to have a loaded chamber indicator on them uh, that anyone can understand the, the meaning of. Every day we, we have shootings where people uh, don't realize the gun was loaded. It's easy to realize or to not realize a gun is loaded. Many people think if you take the, the ammunition clip, you've all seen this the, on TV, right? If you take the ammunition clip out of a semi-automatic pistol, many people think the gun is now empty, but there can still be the one round in the chamber that can be, um, can be ready to fire. 
research that um, that I led some years ago showed that you could you could prevent about a fifth, about 20% of all accidental gun deaths with a simple loaded chamber indicator device. So again, none of these approaches are going to prevent all gun deaths. But the idea is you, you, tr you do this approach, you do this approach, you do that approach, and comprehensively, you start to reduce the toll. It takes us back to, to Bill's point, this call for a comprehensive solution. And in public health, we've seen how that can work. I want to open it up to public questions. So if folks want to line up, and I've got one more while we give people time, if you want to if you want to come to the microphone, we'll hope we can keep the questions on the topic of this panel because we've got a fabulous panel coming up after this that we'll also allow questions with. But I, I, I want to just touch on one issue that we, we've given some statistics that have surprised people. A statistic, Jan, in your book that surprised me was that there are more intimate partner homicides by guns than there, all, than there are by all other weapons combined. Hmm. I think that's right. And so I wanted to ask Bill whether that's whether in your experience um, in Philadelphia, you've, that's what you've seen. And then you, you, you Jan, you, you titled this, this chapter, Evidence for Optimism. So, um, if, you know, I, don't, we, I, don't want us to, I do want us to have some optimism. This chapter is- Optimism is, ev is good, yes. Evidence for Optimism, Policies to Limit Batterers' Access to Guns. So I, I thought, Bill, I'd be interested in hearing if that statistic surprises you or if that's consistent with what you've seen in the emergency room. And, and Jan, if you, could, if you can talk a little about that evidence for optimism. Well, I'll just tell you that I can't comment on that because most of the time uh, when a weapon is used, um, a gun in particular, we don't know any of the circumstances. Most of the domestic abuse and, and injuries that occur actually are seen in the emergency department. Uh, I, I, I just don't know. I don't know the answer to that. So there, there, is there, there is evidence for optimism that comes from the, the research that, that we have been able to do. We know that laws that make it harder for domestic abusers to get guns reduce domestic-related homicides. We know that, that laws like licensing laws here in New Jersey make it harder for high-risk people to get guns. I could, I could go on and on for, uh, for the things that, that we do know, but we obviously do need to know more. I want to make sure I would give the audience yes, a chance. Thanks. This has been very enlightening. My question is, um, why can't we start with the Department of Defense for the research? Uh, <laughs> it sounds like they'd be perfectly uh, open to the idea uh, and have some of the means to do it. Well, the Department of Defense is very interested right now in the epidemic of suicide among service members, many, many of which uh, occur as a result of a firearms. You're quite right, DOD has, has money, um, and so maybe they would be interested in funding research that's, that's focused on service personnel. And, and right now, outside of combat, suicide is an enormous health, health risk with regard to guns for service personnel. I, I think that's a brilliant comment, um, and we have a long history in the United States and in injury and trauma prevention of this symbiotic relationship between civilian uh, science uh, and military science. It, it's an, I think it's a perfect uh, next step. That's a really great recommendation. And we've been thinking in, in those regards as well um, in, in terms of not, not just suicide, but other um, knowledge bases that might inform uh, returning service members, but also uh, might be learned in combat scenarios. I think it was the governor who mentioned that the, the, the military surgeons would come to Newark for training. I know the same thing happens uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. And so there's this back and forth uh, symbiotic relationship and there's no reason that shouldn't be extended. It's a and great Bill, comment. You mentioned that you, even from other countries, people are, are coming to study what you're, how, you're, how you're treating? I'm, I'm not smiling because I'm gleeful about that. I'm, I'm smiling because actually we have actually uh, a constant flow of actually uh, NATO uh, military and then, interestingly enough, uh, several of um, the more senior trauma surgeons, uh, like, jo like Jan says I am, um, <laughs> um, we actually actually travel and what we do is we teach these advanced surgical techniques actually to them to prepare them uh, for war that we've actually developed in these civilian trauma centers related to that. So I first want to congratulate the panel. It's very informative. Um, I think for folks who had very little background in this to folks who have a lot of background. That said, I just want to, um, consistent with my personality, make a couple of quibbles. 
Uh, one is the title, and, and would like to hear your responses. One is the title of this is a culture of violence. Hmm. I think that's an error reminiscent of Oscar Lewis's culture of poverty. And the reason why I think it's um, significant is that every kid I've met, and I've done a lot of work with kids who've committed violent acts, if they had other options to gain what they call juice or power or ways to make money, they'd put down the guns in a second. It's like the crack epidemic. The crack epidemic ended because people were sick and tired of seeing people go crazy and die. And so the young people came up and said, these are just nasty crackheads. And it stopped. I would add that one, um, I'd like to add one of the, the list to Jan's uh, mention of contributing factors to the violence going down in New York City, and that is that young people after the 1990, mid-90s, they got sick and tired of seeing their relatives, their friends, their sisters shot. And they stopped. So part of it was self-initiated. And finally, I want to comment on the individual risk factors. I acknowledge that they're individual risk factors. However, given that gun homicides are so much more common in specific urban areas, essentially where there's concentrated poverty, that we get a lot more bang for our buck if we focus on those areas. I know there was a report several years ago that 80% of the gun homicides, juvenile homicides, occurred in five counties in the United States. It's sort of like income inequality, where they're very poor areas, where kids don't have access to opportunity, and where they use guns for self-protection, that's where the homicides occur. So I'd love to hear your comments. We'll, we will, well, thank you. Uh, we'll certainly get more bang for our buck in focusing on high-risk sort of hot spots with regard to gun-related homicide. But as Charlie and, and Bill were both saying, when one thinks about suicides, 19,000 suicides in the United States every year, more suicides by gunfire than by every other method of suicide combined. When, when we think about suicide, we also have to then think about more rural areas as well. So different approaches for different parts of the problem. I agree. So in, I would also say that it's a, it's a good idea. It's a, it's a shown, proven strategy that focusing on the hotspots, particularly in, in urban areas, you know, where these are most likely to occur, can reduce the issue. The challenge is getting the political capital to do that. Because as, as I was saying before, these are um, abandoned and unwanted areas, which is highly unfortunate. So part of the goal here should be convincing the other areas of the city and areas outside the city that this is their problem too. Those shootings in, the, in North Philadelphia or West Philadelphia are tragedies, yeah? They're tragedies for that community, but they're also tragedies for the city of Philadelphia. They drive people away from the city. They make people think that the city is completely dangerous across the board. So tourism goes down, all manner of other economic negative effects happen. So it, we really do need to begin to think about these as everyone's problem, not simply the isolated issues of a few neighborhoods in the city. I just want to make a quick comment. I, I don't disagree with you that a few years ago, we, we could look at the big cities. I mean, I mean, it's frequently published who are the big cities that have the problem, but the problem is this is an American problem. This is an American problem. Charlie and I were involved with a study that was published actually now about 10 years ago in which we asked what do medium-sized cities in the United States look like? 75 to 100,000 people in those cities. And it was really interesting. Charlie mentioned some of this. It actually reinforced our observation that gun suicide was actually more common in rural, but if you look at these small cities, Allentown, Pennsylvania, Youngstown, Ohio, they have the same problem on a much smaller scale and they're off everybody's radar. Yeah. The dialogue has to be comprehensive. It's an American problem. And if you don't believe that, travel abroad and get asked to talk about this. We are the laughing stock of the free world.
the laughing stock of the free world. So actually, the, the data are actually remarkable. I, this gets maybe to your culture of violence uh, concept. When, when you compare the United States to its, to its peer group of other high-income Western democracies, our, our rates, of, our rates of, of crime are actually not, not out of the, the mainstream. We're pretty average compared to other uh, high-income uh, Western democracies. But what's enormously different is how often that crime results in death, our rate of fatal crime. And that's because our fatal crime is so much more likely to involve a gun. Brian? Thanks. <clears throat> um, I just want to say this is a wonderful panel, and I'm, I know the, the one later is going to be equally wonderful. Better, we're, probably. We're learning. <laughs> <laughs> we're learning all of us here, a lot of really important things that many of us didn't know before. And we're also hearing from scientists what they need to move forward to make things happen. The problem is getting that done. And Charlie just talked a little bit about political will and so on. And that's what's missing. The political will is blocked by the National Rifle Association and the gun industry that supports it. And that's a very great problem. And I would hope that everybody who's here today just doesn't look at this experience as, a, as an example, as a way to learn, but in fact looks at this experience as a way to be inspired and to get out there and be advocate for change. Because if you all don't, and now you know a lot more than everybody else out there, if you all don't, nobody will. And it requires smart people with a scientific uh, bent to lead this kind of fight. And I hope everybody in this room, when you leave, to leave here, will go talk to your friends and your neighbors and your colleagues and get them involved in getting things done. And we've got a lot going here in Jersey right now, thanks to Governor Florio and others. There are lots of opportunities for everybody. Brian, thanks. do you want to introduce yourself? To, um, we I'm, know you well, but just in I'm and Brian you're... Miller that, uh, that Jan talked about before. I, and, didn't uh, feed him. I didn't feed him that, by the way. <laughs> and, but this is what Governor Florio is referring to when he talks about public education. He, he doesn't mean simply teaching people to store their gun safely, important as that is, if they choose to bring a gun into their home, but instead teaching, teaching people about how to influence the, the public debate. Reverend Bob Moore, I'm director of the Coalition for Peace Action. Uh, ceasefire New Jersey is under our umbrella. And uh, I just want to echo to some degree what Brian just said. Um, I, I think the empowerment issue is really sort of front and center. Certainly we need to be informed citizens. You all are helping us with that. We need to have the facts. We need to know what works and what doesn't work. But then we do need to go to that next step of engaging in the citizen process, in the electoral and in the de democratic process, really across the board. Um, so I wanted to just mention something that happened as we've been engaging in that process for a little over two decades. Actually, we, our initial involvement was in the effort to prevent the rescission of New Jersey's assault weapons ban. So we became heavily involved starting in 93. So we've been involved about 20 years now. So we decided that we would have a pre-Mother's Day uh, march uh, and we're regional, so it started in Trenton, New Jersey, where we have a very major manifestation, of course, of gun violence, and then went over to Morrisville, Pennsylvania, over the Trenton Makes Bridge. And about 400 people came who were our supporters. Uh, and so that was, that was kind of exciting, and Mother's Day, it related very well. But as we walked across the bridge into Pennsylvania, here's what we encountered. About 75 counter-protesters, uh, various groups, you know, they use different names, but they're all essentially affiliated with the NRA, of whom dozens were armed. Hmm. So we encountered armed protesters. Now, the police knew about this. The authorities knew about it. They had canceled Little League games that were going to be in the same park that we were at. Not because of us. We're all peaceful. We had 25 groups involved. Uh, all of us peaceful and nonviolent, but because they knew the armed protesters were going to be there. They had to have uh, about 25 state police there to protect us, Morrisville police. So I think in all there were probably at least 30 or 35 police officers. 
But what I wanted to kind of raise and see if you have comments, I know none of you are political scientists, but to my mind, encountering that, and of course there was not only the intimidation of them openly carrying guns, which they're allowed to do legally in Pennsylvania, but they got up close to the stage and literally were shouting down our speakers and intimidating them, including Governor Rendell, the former governor of Pennsylvania. So this happened quite recently, and I found it very chilling. And I've talked to many people who are newly involved in gun violence prevention efforts who say, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I'm a mother. I don't know if the NRA is going to try to hurt my children. And to have people that are openly armed that way, I think this has a deeply chilling effect on the democratic process. How do we openly and honestly debate such an issue when the people on the other side are armed and using that to intimidate us? So that's what I wanted to share. Last, last thing, Governor Florio, I agree, it deserves great praise, and he's going to be speaking at our membership dinner on Sunday afternoon. We still have a few spots, so peacecoalition.org. Peacecoalition.org. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I mean, there's, there's no doubt that the National Rifle Association has, has outsized influence in the United States, outsized in the sense that, as, again, Governor Flora and others have mentioned, when you do public opinion polls, you, you see vast majorities of the public support most reasonable me measures to keep guns out of the hands of high-risk people or to focus on high-risk guns or gun dealers. Uh, you get 80% support or, or higher. You get support among gun owners. Uh, the, the NRA clearly doesn't represent even mainstream gun owners. Uh, so they definitely have outsized influence. Having said that, and I'm sure it is quite intimidating to, to see a group of armed people, I don't believe that there's ever been an incident of an NRA supporter actually shooting. Are you saying that there has been an incident? Are you oh, agreeing man. with me? Yeah. But it's nevertheless, I'm sure, I'm sure it's intimidating. But again, what, what we have is a system where a minority of, of people have more influence. Why do they have more influence if they're a minority? Because they're willing to act. They're, they're willing to come to the events. They're, they're willing to write to their congressperson. They're willing to send money on that one issue alone. And the way that the majority can, can counteract that outsized minority interest, frankly, is by getting more involved, just as others have said today. Can I, I, can I go out on a limb and just also make a comment that, um, so other than the people who are exercising their open carrier rights on that day, have you tried to talk to gun owners? There's a lot of them around, legal gun owners, to try to talk to them. Probably some of them are your neighbors. Yeah? Try to engage them a little bit more in this discussion in a non-threatening way. I think that would go far. And, and we're, we're going to close today with Congressman Rush Holt, who I think will be able to speak to the, the difficult <laughs> political environment. So I, you know, I think you've teed that up well. We're going to finish with the three questions for the women who, from the women who've lined up. So we'll th and, then, and, then, and then we'll close. And short Thank answers. You. Yes. And, right. Well, we'll do it. And we'll try and, be, try and be quick with the questions and the answers. Thank you. I'm the um, executive director of the Philadelphia chapter of Physicians for Social Responsibility. Some people pr here probably know us. Some, probably a lot of people don't. Um, PSR was started 50 years ago around the issue of nuclear weapons. And um, as probably everybody here knows, nuclear weapons are not on the minds of most people in America today. Um, gun violence is. And one of the things I've been thinking about a lot, and especially with the, the man over here who talked about culture and the culture of violence and if this was appropriately named or not, one thing I've been thinking about is a spectrum of violence. Um, and so, I'm a, I'm a veteran also, and uh, you know, when I think about violence, I think it's not just about gun violence in Philadelphia, it's about drone warfare, it's about nuclear weapons, it's about this whole, you know, I mean, humongous spectrum, um, violent video games. And I'm just wondering if anyone wants to speak to that or the extent to which anything, you know, uh, the extent to which you think that may or may not be a, a reality in our, in our world, in our life. Um, hmm. So I'm a veteran too, um, and and uh, boy, I, I would say that that 
it would be wonderful to think about a world in which there was no violence, but the history of man has never had that. And so my feeling is, and especially since I know PSR so well and some of your leaders, I actually think that we really have to deal with this issue. The issue of non-proliferation of nuclear uh, uh, weapons and the use of those weapons is something that all almost all of the governments in the world are focusing on and trying to prevent. I, I think that's necessary and it's, it, it has to happen. But this proliferation actually of gun violence in the United States with, and I'll go back to saying with gag scientists, no funding, and a, and a frightened and muted, muted American public. Uh, I hate to say it, but I actually feel the analogy here is, is what people of color felt 60 and 70 years ago, afraid to speak and afraid to act. And I actually think that's really got to be the focus right now. That's what I think. Just my opinion. Good answer. Next one. All right, Julia. Hi, I'm going to be very quick. I just wanted to add something. I, I, my name is Joanna Ponis. I'm just a mom. Uh, I live here since 10 years. I'm Belgium. When I was 18, my parents didn't allow me to come to the United States be because of the gun violence. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really like this country. I mean, I live here since 10 years. I really like it. I find something strange. Uh, <laughs> I find, for example, I love the tobacco, tobacco rules, which are much stronger. Mm -hmm. so than uh, anywhere in uh, Western Europe. And if we could get it here, we should get that as well. It will take time, I hope not too long, because it was very long, long for the, the tobacco rules. Yeah. And I find it funny. When you take a home policy insurance, other health insurance, when you have a trampoline at home, when you have a... a swimming pool at home, when you have a German Shepherd at home, you have a higher insurance. Why not higher insurance for gun owners? Good point. I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. As, as someone who works in, broadly speaking, the field of injury prevention, don't have a trampoline at home, OK? <laughs> over, over a swimming pool. Yeah, Bill doesn't, <laughs> Bill doesn't want to patch you up. So. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Ruth Perry. I'm the executive director for the Trenton Health Team. And my question, I, I appreciate the conference. I was a former emergency room physician in Philadelphia, so I can relate to a great deal of what you've discussed uh, and saw a lot of what you've discussed. We've also spent some time in business. And so one of the things in business that we've learned is sometimes you need to follow the money. And so as part of your research, have you, has anyone ever mapped all the different economic money streams and money flows that are tied to the NRA, tied to gun violence, gun manufacturers, how that comes out, then the cost to the healthcare system for which you all know so well, and to use that as a platform for additional public education, and that might help spring um, political will, yeah, and people could understand with the money, all this money that is in the system, how that could be redeployed in other ways that would be more beneficial to, to society. So I was just wondering, has any of that been incorporated into your research, or is there an opportunity now to incorporate that yeah, into your that's, research? That's a great, that's a great question, and, and we don't, st I don't think, I don't think I'm misspeaking here. Folks here, we don't spend most of our time studying the gun industry itself, but there are people who do. There's a new book coming out by someone named Tom Diaz about the gun industry. He's written about the industry before. I haven't read the book, so I can't tell you whether I think it's great or not great, but I can tell you I think he's a smart fellow, and he does just that, trying to, to trace the, um, the financial um, influence. We were talking before the panel started about um, about how afraid the industry is of financial challenges. There was a time in the late 90s, early 2000s, when lawsuits were being brought against the gun industry for not doing enough to keep guns out of the hands of dangerous people or for making their guns safer. So what the industry did was it went to Congress and succeeded in having Congress enact and the president sign a law in 2005 that gives the gun industry more protection from lawsuits than any other industry has. It's called the Protection of Lawful Commerce in Arms Act. 
So if that teaches us anything, it teaches us that, the, that attacking an, an industry what, where they care most deeply about profit can be an effective strategy. So, can I just say, there's also another book, uh, that I just had, didn't remember the name, but Googled it, by a person named Richard Feldman. It's called Ricochet. So Feldman was on the inside at the NRA and can offer there's some inside uh, observations of the organization. Um, he remains a very conservative commentator, so just be aware if you're reading this book. But it's worth reading and you'll get some insight from it. Um, Definitely. I think one of the things, the other thing that I was thinking of is you brought up business, okay, so this might be a bit of a deviation, but going back to our science focus, is um, there's a great book that came out last year called Uncontrolled by a guy named Jim Manzi. And it's basically how uh, the business and industry use science in a quick uh, process called a rapid cycle learning process where they learn what works very quickly and invest a whole lot of money in it and quickly dismiss what does not work um, and retain what does. For instance, Google does something like 12,000 little randomized trials every year to figure out which of its products work. His whole treatise of this book is, and I would encourage you to read it, is that government uh, and academia, for polit uh, particularly for political things like this, for studying policies and so forth, uh, need to begin to adopt this rapid cycle learning process. And I think we have a lot to learn in, in that regard. Well, and that's, a, I think, a great point on which to close. We've learned that gun violence is not just a law enforcement issue. It's a public health and health care issue. We've learned that we need a lot more research. To use Bill's language, we need to ungag the scientists. And we really need a, a, a level of research that's equivalent to the size of this epidemic to inform public policy interventions. And that we've learned that there's a lot in public health that we can draw on. The, the idea of a comprehensive solution that includes education, regulatory solutions, culture change, and that innovates over time based on evidence of what's effective can, 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 can lead and can be effective. So please join me in thanking this terrific panel. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.